No shoes, no shirt, no service. Don't step on the grass. No spitting. Don't drink while you're pregnant. Don't enter the store without your mask. Don't leave the toilet seat up. Chew your food before you swallow. So many rules, so much to remember, so many things you don't have permission to do. But in the world of blockchain, there are both permissioned and permissionless chains. And today we've got Jamil Sheik of Chain House joining us to discuss all the things we've got his permission to ask about. And you have permission to listen. And it's not like we could stop you. And why would we anyhow? That seems dumb. This is episode number 446 of the Permissioned Bad Crypto Podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, two, ignition. Who's bad? Those are great rules to live by, Mr. Joel Com. Rules, rules. Signs, signs, everywhere a sign. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? That sounds like something that you want to play this. That was a song that needs to go. Who did that song? I don't know who did it first, but I remember Tesla did it, made it popular, but there was, it was a cover of somebody else from the 60s, I think. <clears throat> well, Tesla. fortunately, I have Spotify right in front of me, and it was actually done by the five man electrical band. Oh, ah, nice. Were- and Tesla, which was a band in the 80s and 90s. Uh, they had an album called the Five Man Acoustical Band when they did a so. All right, nice. I didn't I didn't realize that. I do want to say something about these rules though. Yeah. Uh, because whenever I was younger, that whole "don't leave the toilet seat up" thing, I was like, "Why? I'm gonna leave the toilet seat up. I'm, next time I come to the bathroom, I'm gonna use." And then the ladies were like, "No, it's good. You keep the toilet seat down because when I lift it up, I want to sit on the toilet seat." But it's not about that. What it's actually about is you know every time you flush that toilet. It, it shoots up like a little tiny plume, like a 15 feet in the air. It's little shit spritz. It just <laughs> flies up into the air and lands on your toothbrush. 15 your feet toothbrush. in the air? What, yeah. what kind of toilet do you have? Like a super turbo one? Exploding I mean, turlets. Yeah, I mean, you got some of these turds are big. They need some heavy duty industrial size flushing. And you said shit spritz yeah you don't want the shit i tell you and you'll never forget that the shit spritz if you keep the toilet seat up and you flush it you get shit spritz everywhere and you don't want that so i think that's a pretty good rule to do keep that welcome to the bad crypto podcast uh, also the good hygiene and commode implementation podcast you get more than you bargained for here and we're glad that you're here want to give a shout out to a new show sponsor who will be interviewing shortly it's called gamer hash if you have a pc that you use for gaming you know if you've got spare power on your pc you can actually use it to mine bitcoin Um, And it doesn't eat up your entire processor power. I'm using it. I downloaded the GamerHash miner. I'm running it right now on my computer. Now, usually if you run a Bitcoin miner on your uh, computer, you can't do anything else. It's impossible. But GamerHash only uses your unused processor power. And I would say right now my computer is mining probably about a buck 50 in Bitcoin a day. Like it's it, during it's when it's idle, it's just, it's free Bitcoin that I'm pulling down. I've been doing it for about a week. It looks like I've got about $18 right now. We're going to talk to $18 in a week. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So that's something that's going to be really interesting for us to talk about. I'm, I'm really excited about interviewing this guy because think about it. If you buy a computer, heavy duty, badass PC, that's going to cost you about a grand, $1,200. And if you're earning 10 20 bucks a week by just using gamer you could literally pay for your freaking computer over time right go check it out gamerhash.com we will have an interview with them in the near future and glad to be using their product and for them to be sponsoring our show mr travis right that's very fancy hey, we have some other news oh you i was going to say that i wanted to talk about the other news go oh, ahead share the news it's news <laughs> sweet it's actually awesome so so I don't know if you guys knew about this or not, but Amazon has Audible, and this is where those audio books are located at. Well, now they're expanding it and doing podcasts there, and so we are now on Amazon Podcast, and so you can get to that at badco.in forward slash Amazon, 
And uh, I believe it's like in their music portal is where they put all of their podcast stuff as well. So yeah, they're getting it, on board with the word. It's a good looking page and there's nowhere to review on the page, but I think just follow, go to badco.in forward slash Amazon. It'll take you to this page and you can add episodes. You can listen there as well. You can listen on your desktop. You can listen on the Amazon music app. Also the nifty show is on there, Travis. So Ooh. if you go to, nifty dot show forward slash amazon it'll take you to the nifty show page and and there's one more that i haven't set up a link for yet but eos voice news is also mm. there on amazon music all of our shows are there mm. and so is like probably joe rogan's podcast and bongino and all kinds of people's podcasts i'm sure i would imagine so so just another venue uh for you to listen to the show what we want you to do is go listen to it on all the different platforms and then let us know if it sounds different on any of them Mm -hmm. yeah give us five star reviews everywhere you can that would be perfect all righty and speaking of five stars our interview today with jameel Sheik is a five-star interview so let's get to it it's a chain house it's my tomate letting it all hang out i guess I like right? the chains hang out travis you put your chains back nobody wants to see that yeah come on this is a family <laughs> show Jamil Sheik is the CEO of Chainhouse, an advisory software development application studio and education company focused on blockchain, AI, and machine learning. He's got a long experience working in the financial world with Lehman Brothers, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Sun Microsystems, Sony, Citigroup, and he's currently authoring a group. Uh, he's authoring a book, rather. You don't author a group, but you might author a book on uh, Corda. I don't even know what that is, but but he probably knows because he's writing a book on it. And we're going to talk all about blockchains, enterprise, and otherwise. Jamil, welcome to Bad Crypto. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Did you, uh, when you became CEO of Chainhouse, did you sing that song? Um, you know, the, the, the root of the name of Chainhouse is actually, you know, uh, Ramstein? The yeah. Group? Uh, yeah, so they have a song called Do Host. Do Host. Uh, yeah, yeah so do, it was Do Host. That song oh. is when I came up with a chain house name. Well, there you go. So, you know, there's the connection. You have found the magical bad crypto musical connection. And now we got to add two songs to the playlist. Okay, I'm, I'm on it, Travis. You can ask the first question and while I do that. Right on. So, you know, maybe maybe give give us an idea of what is what is chain house. So we do we do a bunch of different things. Uh, uh, I started in crypto. I started mining in 2012 on a laptop. Um, I still have the hard drive. It's in a static sleeve somewhere. I can't get inside of it. Um, so anybody who can get inside of it, there's probably a bunch of bitcoins there. And then I got into doing more blockchain stuff in 2017. And in 2018, we started doing a lot of events. So I run the largest blockchain meetup group in New York City, the most popular. We do about 30, 40 events when there were events per year. I remember that. Um, yeah. And so you yeah, remember that? <laughs> so uh, yeah, our meetup is now like 6,000 people, 7,000 people. Uh, so 2018, we were doing a lot of events. And then 2019, we saw a need for education and we started doing a lot of education classes. Uh, and so we had the most popular blockchain class in New York City, in-person class for executives, um, and it was well attended. Uh, and then uh, that went well. Uh, and now in 2020, we focus on uh, services, um, development services, advisory services, and we are building a suite of products. And then 2021, we're going to shift into digital security, Slum DeFi. Um, and then into probably a holding company by 2022. You know, having watched this for now eight years of involvement, what do you what are you observing is the level of interest from enterprise? How quickly is it, you know, escalating? So I think 2017 people, you you talk to an executive at an enterprise and you say blockchain, they say, do you mean Bitcoin? Uh, and then it was downhill from there. Uh, and then 20. Uh, 18 was like, okay, let me do a proof of concept. I tried to get my head around this. And 2019 is was like, hey, maybe we can do something with this. And I think now we are at some kind of inflection point where there is now questions around enterprise blockchain versus the public blockchain. Should they converge? Are they the same thing? Which is better? Can I get the benefits of the enterprise inside the public blockchains? And I think that's going to happen this year and next year. Uh, and so... 
but you know, blockchain is an unintended consequence of Bitcoin. Like nobody planned on blockchain taking off and doing its own thing, right? It was broken off of the Bitcoin um, uh, concepts and then and, and it was running on its own and things. So we don't really know where it's going to go, but I think it really looks like um, that's the tra trajectory. And then enterprise blockchain allowed us to go to companies and say, hey, there is something called enterprise blockchain and it gives you the things that you are you want and not the things that you might be scared of like privacy that you want privacy you want private transactions you want some type of scalability it gives you those things um and decentralization and disintermediation are not part of it um so don't worry about losing your business um is this something you want to have a conversation about and then they'll say yes so, so it's kind of like an on-ramp to like maybe the public blockchain and educating the enterprise on public blockchain um and so that 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 creates a conversation piece for us um and we see that that is evolving rapidly. So enterprises are more, uh, they, they have, their appetite has increased to understand what blockchain is and adopt it within within their organization. And we see, we obviously, we see a lot of that this year. Yeah, so what kind of businesses are, are adopting enterprise blockchains the most right now? I think you see a lot in the banks. So in the banking space, um, like banks like HSBC um, uh, are looking at that. The idea of me being able to create a completely brand new digital asset, uh, it intrinsically is Nate on the blockchain. So I can create tokens which represent or assets that exist like a credit default swap. This token points to a credit default swap and it represents that. So I trade the token, therefore I am trading a credit default swap. I trade but tokens, therefore that, I am, Joel. Yeah, therefore I am. <laughs> but um, if I can create the asset itself where it itself has value because i'm double spend protected right um if that asset itself can be created and i can concoct it in any way i want it's programmable i can create a brand new digital asset a brand new financial instrument and then i can trade it and if i trade it typically right now the banks want to do that on an enterprise blockchain will that be the case a couple years from now i think not i think it will move towards the public blockchain once there are the right features like uh, scalability, like where can I do thousands of transactions per second if necessary? Um, and that's not possible in the public blockchain entirely yet. And with complete privacy, that's not there yet. Um, even though there is pseudo anonymity on the blockchain, on the public blockchain, I can still use data anal analytics to figure out who, who's who uh, if I wanted to. Uh, and so banks are looking at the finances, financial companies, supply chain, um, real uh, insurance companies uh, are looking at it and saying, "Hey, how do I how do I use this?" And the enterprise blockchain really solves two or three core problems. One is reconciliation, which is a multi-trillion-dollar business problem. Right? So businesses have this, and it's kind of they don't realize they have it. Which is, you have a mortgage company, I have a mortgage company. I use some rinky-dinky software called whatever Mortgage Pro, whatever it's called. You use something else called Mortgage Excel, whatever it is. And you and I are communicating our mortgage deals. You're, let's say, uh, an appraiser, and I'm a, I'm a funder. You are are communicating via deals, so our communication may be standardized. We might use email, we might use some HTTP thing, whatever it is. But our data models behind the scenes, how I'm restoring information and how you're storing information, is radically different. And that impotence, that difference in that, is problematic. It's a cost. It's a hidden cost. There's an economic cost of that. I've got to translate whatever you're saying to me back into my own systems and store it, right? Um, so if you say invoice A A one A one two three, I have well, I don't use invoices that have letters and I have invoices that have numbers in them only. So I've got to translate that kind of stuff. And so our data model conceptually are different, even though our businesses are the same. So we're speaking almost. Uh, the same language, but we're not understanding each other. There's an enormous amount of internal translations that are occurring. Um, and so DLT has helped solve that, not entirely, but help reduce reconciliation costs because then my database and your database are exactly the same. It's cryptographically insured data models. That is very, very useful. That can bring an enormous amount of costs down. That also brings potential new revenue sources, like, for example, blind pricing where you you want to sell an asset, but you don't want to disclose the price. I want to sell an asset. I don't want to disclose the price. We we jointly put in indicative pricing and then a price emerges 
through some valuation model, and then we agree that that's the the price. I'm not going to tell you how much it is. Mm, it's none of your business. <laughs> exactly, and I mean that's that's how banks are, right? They don't they they're not going to. You know the rule. Like if, the minute you first state a price, the probability of you underselling yourself is high, right? And so um, it's a, it's a lose lose scenario to give up a price first. And so can I give an indicative price in a confidential manner and then arrive at a valuation that 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 the result of that valuation is public and shared? Um, and that's a reconciliation model that is uh, potentially a revenue model for anybody that can create that kind of platform. And then third is like digital assets. is How can I create brand new financial instruments or any kind of instrument and trade it? Right. Uh, and and uh, if I'm, let's say, Goldman Sachs, I create a brand new unheard of financial instrument and it's pegged against LIBOR and it's this and this and that has all these features and I issue it and it's now intrinsically natively inherently sitting on the blockchain by itself intrinsically not- natively inherently all these big words yeah all of them that was great uh, you almost like yeah. a rapper there for a moment I'm yeah I'm working on that <laughs> can, you, can you bust a rhyme for us um no <laughs> blockchain yeah. rapper here it is Jamil <laughs> <laughs> nope. No, he'd be MC Sheik. MC Sheik. DJ So you know, yeah. uh, Jamil, you write a lot about um, permissioned and permissionless chains. Maybe you can make it simple. Break it down, MC Sheik style. The uh, the difference between <laughs> permissioned and permissionless. So permissionless. I mean, in general, it, what it means is that anybody can join a network right? Kind of like the internet, right? So you, there's, there's no reason why you can't go to google.com and google.com has to know who you are. Anybody can go to google.com as long as you've got an internet connection <clears throat> uh, and that's permissionless. And then permissioned is more like um, email and you, or actually a better example is a library card, which even though a library is often a public good um, and it's funded by the government, it's a public publicly funded institution, you still need a library card to use certain services. And so permission is more like, hey, you need to, I need to know who you are in order for you to use services here um, and the network services, which may be trading or uh, the platform. Um, and that's kind of the difference. And now it's it's a great, it's, it's, it's a spectrum of things, right? It's not just black and white. Uh, what does it mean permission? If I want to be a miner on Bitcoin, can you and I be miners on Bitcoin today given our infrastructure and our energy costs? The answer most likely is no. We would have to go somewhere else. We need a different uh, economic structure to be able to run our mining rig. Is that a form of permission? Is that being permissioned? Or are we talking about different type of barriers? So I, I don't like the terminology of the permission versus the permission unless they're barriers. And there's nothing that I've seen that has, has zero barriers. Either you're paying transaction fees or if on a, if you're on a per, quote unquote permission network, your transaction fees are typically zero by default. Um, a service might add additional tra- transaction fees, but by default, there's zero transaction fees. Um, so is the transaction fee on Ethereum and Bitcoin that in order for you to buy and sell Ethereum or Bitcoin, a form of a barrier? Um, it is economically, it is some kind of a barrier and there may be other barriers. So it is a, it's a form of barrier intentionally set up uh, because um, the the participants of that network want that barrier, um, and so um, that's why it's set up. I think a lot of our listeners, when you were talking about that, I think they said, "What's a library card?" <laughs> 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 um, so I want to ask about this. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to ask about. So you have you have this really large meetup in New York where it, yeah. it's a convergence of blockchain, AI, data science. You said you have 6,000 people that used to show up to meetings when we had meetings. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing, a convergence of those? Because, you know, blockchain is one thing, but then AI and data science are a whole other thing. How are you seeing convergence of those uh, in the space? Or what are some, some cool applications of combining those? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. Um, so uh, like one thing about the meetups that we do is we get to see a lot of use cases and we get to meet a lot of people that are working on really cool stuff. The convergence, there are a number of convergences. One is like 
we're starting to accumulate a large amount of data now, right? Around on blockchain, even DLTs are starting to accumulate large amounts of data and you need large amounts of data to be able to do, to use AI and, and, and machine learning. If you don't have the right data, then you're not, you're not going to be able to do any, anything. Um, and actually DLTs can improve AI. So AI requires good data. If your data is bad, your AI is going to be bad, right? So, um, and because the DLTs are this, cons- you know, cryptographically pr- uh, insured data models, meaning that you can't modify the data models without breaking some cryptography, uh, th- your data quality is going to be higher. So, in the th- kind of things that you're going to see AI and machine learning, one is fraud, fraud detection, you know, fraud, fraud analytics, um, uh, uh, automated trading, so use algorithmic trading. Uh, uh, of what we have equities right now, we'll eventually shift to algorithmic trading of digital assets. I'm going to create brand new assets um, and trade them algorithmically. I'm going to use AI. I might use AI to produce assets that I've never thought of. I can go through customer behavior, trading behavior, customer sentiment, and produce entirely using AI an, an asset that does not exist and I've never conceived of. And the AI produces the economic uh, parameters around this asset issues the asset and, and creates a profit from uh, it. And so this wait, this is mind blowing. Like AI creating an asset that we didn't even think of. Um, like AI is going to suggest, hey, here's here here's what you guys need to make now. Or will the data itself just surface in a way? That I I don't understand how that works. Yeah, I think so. One, it's it's not going to be that AI is going to run amok and like start creating things by itself. I think there's going to be. That's what you say. Have you seen the movies? <laughs> um, I actually, yeah. So I actually put out an event out. Um, and, and I think it's about thirty years out. That I'm, I'm getting people signing up for on how do we fight AI back. I actually put that event out. It's on Eventbrite, by the way. Because uh, I'm like, we're going to probably be fighting AI back out in 30 years. And people are signing up for that event. Uh, everybody but... <laughs> everybody by now knows that Ben Gertzel is going to be the first to go. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's just... <laughs> I've seen the movies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I think that that's where the, their convergence will be is that AI, you're, I think you're right. It will make suggestions. It's not going to be allowed to like run off and do things, at least initially. It's going to make suggestions that, hey, these are the kind of products that the market will have the most appetite for uh, as opposed to these, right? And the AIs will produce, will suggest customized digital assets and say, this is how we're going to, this is what the parameters that you should put in. But if the AI is truly evil, it's not going to be like, we suggest you turn over all power to us. It's going to be like, uh, we suggest you push this button right here. Yeah, that's the one. That's the, <laughs> just push that. Button. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, yeah, I think I think you can always unplug it, and so uh, as long as as long as the AI doesn't have the energy, figure out the energy, uh, I think we're okay. We can always unplug it. But yeah, anything anything that AI produces will go through the proper regulatory procedures, compliance, the internal risk management, and all that. Um, but in, in terms of convergence, I think you're going to start to see that. You're going to start to see AI and machine learning used on supply chain, right, to to uh, detect fraud on supply chain, which is pretty rampant. Uh, people inflating prices, like people taking meat and like, you know, dipping it in water overnight to inflate the weight and all that kind of stuff. And then once you have circular supply chain, you'll be able to detect fraud. And that's where machine learning will be used. I think that's going to be more immediate. I was actually, so I, I don't know if a lot of people have even heard of Ben Gertzel. So he's known as one of the, what, inventors of the father of AI. And there's an interesting video on YouTube where he talks about, are we building a psychopathic idiot savant global brain? Yeah, which I, I think we need to interview him to determine that because that sounds pretty fascinating. Yeah, I think the, the goal is to build to, to to arrive at some type of singular, you know, intelligence, and I think AI will eventually converge to some type of singular intelligence. So, how long until we get to like master control, like on Tron, right, where there's like we all sort of, you know, the uh, it, you know the the idiocracy has we've all been dumbed down sufficiently to the point where we just bow down to AI and whatever AI says is the new God. And we have like, we okay, well, AI said it. And so it knows better than we, how long until we get to that kind of point? I, I personally don't think we're really going to get there anytime soon. So there's really two kinds of AI, general and narrow. Narrow is like, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, my, 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 my dishwasher will figure out what I want on Thursday, like whatever, my laundry, whatever, how I want to do my laundry. It does one thing. 
and then general AI, which is what we as humans do. We do multiple things simultaneously. Like you and I are talking right now um, and we're thinking at the same time. We might be thinking about two separate things at the same time while we're talking. We're standing, we're blinking, all those kind of things. We're doing in an orchestrated manner. Um, that's general AI. That is extremely complicated, and we are not even. And once quantum anywhere. computing gets here, and it makes it, it's going to make it a whole lot easier, right? I think, yeah, I think that 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 that'll change things. But still, it, it's still uh, uh, a long ways to go. I think even with quantum computing, we're still going to have a long ways to well, go. Well, this is twenty twenty. Yeah, I mean, the, the computer- you say just twenty twenty as though everything hasn't already hit us this year. <laughs> It's no, no shit coming. Nobody will ever say, oh, it was just 2020. Unless 2021 <laughs> is even more of a hellish nightscape. You know? <laughs> Every year. I'm pounding. Yeah. I mean, we still have to have the data. We still have to have data that general AI can use. Even if we had the computing power, we will not have the data. So uh, we will still need the data for able to say, hey, how can I blink and, and view things and interpret things while I'm walking, uh, you know, while I'm talking? while I'm singing, while I'm thinking, how can I do all of that? At the same time, I might have the computing power, but I don't have uh, the depth and the data, then um, the computing power will be somewhat uh, useless. But we'll see, yeah. I mean, we the jump that we, we made from uh, machine learning, from just regular machine learning to deep, what's called deep learning, was just because of some tweaks in algorithms. Uh, and that made us, allowed us to do these huge and phenomenally different things. Um, um, like the Alpha Mind. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the Alpha Mind um, uh, documentary on Netflix. And if you haven't, I really recommend you seeing mm. it. Uh, so there's just a tweak on some algorithms, and all of a sudden we were into this whole new thing called neural networks and deep learning. Um, and all of a sudden we can beat somebody in in, uh, in the game of Go, which is extremely complex, far more complex than chess. I wonder, Jamil, when you have to be a bit of a futurist, right? Because everything you're dealing with is is looking towards where things are going. When the iPhone came out in 2007, the mobile world changed really fast. When uh, blockchain, you know, really began to surface, you know, we've been around here, yes, for 10 years or so since, since Bitcoin, but the world is changing really fast. What do you, you know, 10 years from now, how far down the line do you see us? Will we have fully integrated blockchain into everything or will will fiat currency be completely gone? You know, everything gone digital, just futurize for us a little bit. Um, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I think look, what I've tried to do is stop predicting the future um, and just focus on the short term demands that the market needs. Right. And so and not really try to predict the future because I think as you can see what happened this year it's it's everything will go upside down over any kind of you know situation that arises so with with the virus um, all our plans were really just thrown out the window and we had to change a bunch of things that you know we were planning to do uh, but in general in general I think we are in 10 years we are going to be we will be using digital currency as a default and not fiat currency uh, will central banks be involved or not? I can't say because we're, t- we're we're talking to some of them. I can't really say anything about that right now. But um, uh, I think we will be in a very very different world from a currency point of view. Uh, and uh, I think that's gonna it'll be it, it won't necessarily be a better world though, uh, because inflation is not necessarily just a function of supply and demand. It's a function of faith and trust in that currency. And so if you if you lose trust in that currency it'll depreciate in value and uh, you can pump more and more or less and less and remove the supply and it still can depreciate in value because the value, the, the belief in that currency changes. So I think digital currency will not necessarily, even if it's peer to peer, purely peer to peer, which again, it's hard to do like Bitcoin network is not, is not, if you, there's a studies out on, on how, how influential maybe about six to eight miners are like pools of miners are. Um, it's not f- completely and fully decentralized or purely decentralized, right? And if you look at Satoshi's white paper, the first line, he says hybrid, no, sorry, he says pure peer-to-peer. Um, and so even if we were in a pure peer-to-peer world in 10 years, we would still have issues uh, with the currency um, if the world was on one single currency and that currency was devalued or it, it fluctuated and it's valued differently in different locations. Um, there still may be problems. So I don't think it necessarily will lead to a happier world. We will still have people who are poor and disen- disenfranchised or unbanked uh, will continue, and that it, so it won't solve the problems. But we will have, probably be 
uh, uh, you know, using less paper and more of the digital stuff. Mm. And blockchain will just be like, you know, just like the internet, it'd be a given, you know, and I don't think it's, it'll be a word that even people talk about. Uh, much like you don't ask somebody say, hey, do you have internet access anymore? 15 years ago, you did, right? Say, hey, do you have internet access at home? But today you don't. And I think it'll be the same for blockchain. Blockchain is just an evolution of distributed computing. It's nothing uh, more than that. So distributed com computing has been evolving. And it was like, I can do something with my computer, then I can connect to, to a bulletin board through a modem. And also now I can connect to each other through a network. And now I'm using cryptography uh, applied to that. And so just in, like another evolution of it. I love that. That's like maybe a little something that should be on a show card or something. It's the evolution of distributed computing. Ooh, uh, that's sexy. It is sexy. It's sort of like how BitTorrent and some of these other things, you know, Napster and BitTorrent and then the, the evolution of distributed computing over time. Um, yeah. that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Hey, so here in the show notes, it says you're writing, you're writing a book. You're writing a book about James Corden. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> talk show host, right? Right? Um, not not that book yet, but um, I I finished writing the book on Corda. Corda, for, oh uh, yeah, my bad. What's what's Corda? Yeah. It's not James Corden. I see. No, it's not James Corden. Um, and there's no relationship between Corden and. There's Corda. no. There's not going to be any uh, car karaoke today. <laughs> no, okay. but uh, so Corda is a uh, blockchain, open source, and enterprise licensed version. Uh, there's two versions of it um, uh, created by a company called R3. Um, and um, they're based in London and New York. Uh, and it's you can consider it as an equivalent or a competitor hyperledger. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so I finished writing it. I wrote it for a publisher called O'Reilly uh, Media. Um, not Bill O'Reilly, but O'Reilly Media, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the best tech publisher for... Uh, um, yeah, and so they, um, I'm, I'm done. I submitted my final final draft um, last Congrats. week. Congrats, that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, it'll be out in, in November. It's already on Amazon for pre-order. So Corda, so, when uh, Moon, when Lambo. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm close to Lambo already. Uh, but um, uh, um, you know, I'm long crypto, but um, Corda is a permission chain, so it's it's great for services for the service side. So, you know, like I will be able to generate more business on the service side and. The banks are using it. Um, so HSBC is using it, uh, for example, to do FX trading. Uh, I was just on a project last year with the World Bank uh, using Corda for a supply chain project. So Corda is one, like, one of those blockchains that are being used, but it's not. It's very quiet. It's a little bit of a quiet storm. Um, and I first learned about Corda by accident. I met with, uh, with one of their employees for Sushi. Um, this is early... Um, uh, was it 2018? And he said, Jamil, you know, all the banks are using it, but nobody's talking about it. I'm like, cool, I'm going to write a book about it uh, and uh, and build a business around it. By the way, I did meet with um, Nick Spanos a couple of days ago. It was a really funny incident, by the way. Oh, you didn't have bagels? Uh, so I, I, I walked into the uh, blockchain center uh, and I said, um, I was with a couple of guys and we walked in. It was kind of like gangster the way we walked in uh, in intentionally. And it was just for fun. And I was like, you know, give me your private keys. We're here. We're here for your private keys. And he didn't laugh. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yeah. hey, you want my private keys? I ain't giving you none of my keys. No, you know why? What happened the day before? And I didn't know this. The day before, they got robbed. Oh shit! They, there were two guys that came into the blockchain center, uh, and the blockchain center is brand new, right? So we might be doing some work with them, but it's brand new, so it's being renovated. So two guys came in and tried to take Nick's phone. Oh. And there, there was a fight, and they beat this two two guys up, um, and um, the police got involved. So, um, so that's why he didn't laugh because normally he, he would he would laugh. Uh, so, and I was like, he's like, oh shit, here's day two, and he was about to get he was about to get up. <laughs> like, <laughs> you would yeah, like him when he's angry. That's no, but that's the vibe in New York right now. <laughs> people taking people's phones yeah, for their privacy. Uh, he was just on the show, what about a week ago, I think. Yes, I heard it. I heard it. Yeah. So you didn't bring bagels. If you would have walked in with bagels, you would have been, you know, only half next bagel, time. Yeah, next time he's, bagel. Need he's a hard he's a hard guy to hug. He's really big, <laughs> right? He can punch hard. He's a hard, so. hard guy to <laughs> hug. He can punch really hard. So. There's only gonna be there's only gonna be two hits here, me hitting you and you hitting the floor. <laughs> And you yeah, picking exactly. up the bagel off the floor and handing it to me. <laughs> and then me taking another bite of this bagel. Step three. 
So I actually, I've not been familiar with Corda. R3.com is the site. And this is really way more extensive than I knew. And, uh, you know, I see Microsoft, NASDAQ. I mean, this is powering MasterCard. Um, a lot of industry, uh, big uh, Fortune 500s are using this to build their apps. Yes. So we we we, uh, we focused on, on Corda because, one, nobody knew about it and it was being used. And so uh, we deliver classes. I wrote the book. We do uh, we have a, a bunch of clients, you know, some great clients um, that are involved with uh, we're doing core development for. Um, and we're building a bunch of tools. So like, we have applications that we're building for ourselves and then we build applications for other companies. So we're building an application called Realize. Um, are you guys familiar with wholesaling, real estate wholesaling? Do tell. So imagine you're a seller um, and as I mean, legally in the U.S., the only person that can sell for you is a, a licensed agent or a um, or yourself, right? You can't. Nobody else can sell for you. But what I can do for you is I can come to you and enter into a purchase agreement, and we can say, "Hey, let's close out in ninety days or one hundred twenty days." And if I can convince you of that, that paper I have, that purchase agreement, I can trade it, uh, and so it actually is sold. There's an active market like in Jersey and Ohio and Florida where uh, wholesalers go to owners and say, hey, give me a purchase agreement. Let's sign. Let's close in 120 days. And then the wholesaler then takes that purchase agreement and sells that purchase agreement to an investor. The investor then buys that agreement. Um, but there is no orderly market. And so we're creating a platform called Realize, R-E-I-I, sorry, R-E-I-L-I-Z-E.com uh, for, um, for that market. And we're using Corda and Ethereum to do that. Um, and then we're creating another platform called Disperso, which is for um, uh, payments, uh, which is something that we are talking to the World Bank uh, with uh, around. I like that name. That reminds me of the uh, of that quote. I think it was a Tupac quote that realize, realize, realize. <laughs> yes, exactly. So REI is real estate investment. It's a, it's a common acronym. So that's why we went with REI, L-I-Z-E. And the dot com was available. I was like, all right, I'm going to take it. So, yeah. Well, professor, can I call you professor? Yeah, I'm, I teach at uh, Columbia Business School, NYU and CUNY, so, blockchain, AI. And blockchain, AI. AI. So I, I'm curious yeah. about, you know, the, the next generation here is they're sitting in your classes. How engaged are they in this topic? Um, for the blockchain stuff, they're very, very engaged. And um, so... Uh, I, I taught, um, the last class I taught was in the summer of last year at, at Columbia Business School. I had a packed class. It was, um, they had some great questions. The students were fantastic. Uh, they're very eager to understand where this goes. And they, they come from like management consulting, healthcare, banks, uh, and they want to take this stuff back and go back to their, their jobs and say like, what does this mean for us? Uh, and so there was, it was really intensive, uh, a, a course and really, you know, I'd spend maybe a half an hour after class sitting there a a answering questions, right? Which I normally won't do for any other class. Um, so there's this there's great interest. I think um, every class that I teach, um, I think um, there has never been a letdown uh, in terms of interest, whether it's permission or cryptos, it's trading, because uh, we cover everything. We cover you know, um, you know things like Chainlink and every you know like what what is it, what is all this stuff you know. We cover everything and it's um, everybody's very excited about it. And I'm excited. It makes me excited. And I learned a lot from them, to be honest, because the questions are, you know, they're, they ask me stuff that, to be honest, some stuff I don't even know. And then I go research and I get back to them. Um, so I learn a lot myself. Nice to be able to say, I don't know. Right. That's my favorite answer. Um, yeah. Yeah. It just covers I mean, everything. It's like, I don't have to know it all anymore. And, you know, you're, you're old enough to me all to know that uh, you don't have to have answers right. yeah absolutely and so it, it's it's i teach because i learn that's why i teach i love that, that yeah <clears throat> creating stacking skills and sharing your knowledge and building building big groups of, of like-minded people writing books and sharing your wisdom coming on podcast and and sharing your thoughts as well we really appreciate you coming on back crypto uh, mc chic I, I appreciate it. I'm going to start my DJ career pretty soon. So you can be both. You can got, be DJ Jamil or MC Sheik. You can be both. It just yeah, depends. I want. I want to guess. I want to guess on the cat, like DJ one two three. Isn't that easy? Easy to remember? <laughs> well, if you're rapping for Sesame Street, yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> that might be a market. Uh, I don't know the market. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jamil. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Sheik, for your excellent information. You guys go check out his stuff and his book, Jamil.io, is where you can learn more. Uh, typically, Mr. Travis Wright, we save news for our Thursday bad news episode, but there's a couple things that went down this week that I thought were really interesting, and, and I didn't want to leave them out. Uh, one of them is around Uniswap. I've used Uniswap a few different times as a, a in-browser application instead of exchanges because you can swap out tokens for Ethereum or for each other as long mm. as there's a little bit of liquidity there. And it's been a it's a, been a great tool to use just casually. Yeah, pretty handy. You seem pretty pleased about that. You're like, oh, dude, Travis. Hey, Uniswap, check it out, man. You should go look and see uh, Uniswap. Because everybody who has used uh, the Uniswap platform got at least 400 tokens. Yeah. Some people got a whole lot more depending on how much liquidity that they airdrop. And then I was like, oh, my God, that's awesome. I've never used it. And so I didn't get any. I was disappointed. I thought you had for sure. But basically, it is a decentralized Ethereum trading platform, and they released their governance token, UNI, U-N-I. And all you had to do is go to, to Uniswap and log in with the wallet you would have used, and you have 400 UNI that are waiting for you right there right now. And so mine were waiting for me. And I'm just going to timestamp this recording. We're actually recording on the 19th of September around 1 30 p.m. here. So it's Saturday. The show comes out Sunday. But as of now, Uniswap is $6 and one cents. That's for if you got 400 and you're going to wake up to that surprise, you've got $2,400 in free money. And get this, it hit as high as let's like seven dollars and 67 cents it's currently number 33 no eight dollars and 40 cents it hit uh yesterday it's number 33 in market cap out of nowhere yeah and check this out so there's a tweet on here from a dude named private chad i'll be a private chad a chad for money no he was talking about how his buddy um provided liquidity to uniswap and received 128 thousand uniswap tokens Oh my God, that's like a million dollars when it's all said and done. If they sold like the eight dollars you were just talking about, wow! So this is um, an autom automated decentralized exchange, and it I, I guess this is a form of uh, of DeFi, right? This is yep. decentralized finance, and so you know I'm looking at this price right now. I actually I sold a hundred of my four hundred free Uniswap. Um, at about five dollars and fifty cents, and I'm hodling the rest because I'm thinking, you know, DeFi is so hot right now, and what if it's the next thing to to go to the moon? Um, a lot of people use Uniswap just to easily swap over to other tokens. There's another project out there called Trust Swap, which our uh, friend Adam Barlam and Jeff Kredekas had created that thing, and that thing took off as well. So DeFi, DeFi so hot, as you say, Mister Jocom. Um, maybe there'll be an NFT swap protocol sometime. I, I don't know. So uh, Meltem de Mirrors is a strategy officer at CoinShares. And he said, in a time when people are being greedy and malicious, they did something generous and benevolent. And the fact that it was unexpected was really special. I agree. It was thanks, Uniswap. It's Appreciate so interesting, though. It's like a whole bunch of people got them just out of the blue. How is the price increasing over time when you think people are trying to dump them? I think it's on the radar now. And people are like, this is a popular site yeah. uh, for decentralized trading. Yeah. You know, and, what, you don't and, have... didn't, and then uh, what they uh, made it available on Coinbase Pro as well. Right. Now it's on, now it's on Coinbase Pro. So that's also that probably helped. I wonder how me. they did that. How do they orchestrate that? Keep it quiet and get it on all these exchanges all at once. Well, I'm sure they kept it confidential. They probably had NDAs with Coinbase. Say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to drop. You know, all these tokens to people, there's going to be a need for liquidity. And Coinbase probably said, all right, we're your Huckleberry. All right, Huckleberry. Yeah. So so there's that piece of news. Also, I discovered this yesterday, Travis. We've talked about decentralized um, video platforms before as a way to escape YouTube. And, of course, we use library.tv, LBRY.tv. There's a bad crypto channel there. And every video that's on YouTube 
automatically gets pulled into library. If YouTube were to ever take us down again, even though they took us down for the wrong, you know, for bad reasons the first time, if they took us down for any reason, again, all of our videos live on library. Well, they have rolled out a new front facing consumer site to compete with YouTube called Odyssey. It's spelled O-D-Y-S-E-E, odyssey.com. All the videos that are on library, this decentralized video storage service, you can now see at odyssey.com. Hmm. Maybe some of those uh, censored videos that are gone, maybe they'll pop up in there. I'm sure they're there already. This is basically everything that's in the library catalog. This is just, it's just a new face. It's a rebranding. If you go look at it, it's more playful. But what's really interesting, if you pull up the site right above the videos is Google's old mantra, don't be evil in the Google colors. The D is blue, the O is red, the mm -hmm. N is yellow. Don't be evil because remember Google removed that from their uh, whatever their mission statement was. Yeah. Also, by the way, just to kind of throw this out there, there's another website called altcensored.com, and those are all videos that YouTube has censored. So buyer beware, go there and check it out, see what's going on with that, if that's what you want to check out. I think it's interesting to, like, why, because I'm just always curious now, why is why is YouTube banning this? Why, what's their reason? What's their, what's their, uh, their motive? You so, heard my fee-fees. Yeah, they heard my fee-fees. They heard somebody's fee-fees. Now, you discovered this, Travis. Do you want to share this last piece of news? Yeah, I got an email yesterday, I believe it was, and it's from Nomics.com. And Nomics is uh, Clay Collins, I believe is his name, the CEO. He used to run lead pages out of, uh, out of Minneapolis, I believe. And he came over to the crypto space. And we interviewed him back on episode 217 of the Bad Crypto Podcast called Crypto Data Your Way with Clay Collins of Nomics. Well, they do a lot of deep diving into information and pull out a lot of different analytics. And so what they did was they looked at all the crypto podcasts in the world. They did a bunch of analytics based on reviews, listens, uh, reputation of the podcast, backlinks, a bunch of different parameters that they pulled in. Turns out we're the number four. No, uh, number five. We, we've moved down a slot. Um, I, I think you told me about it first and you said we were ahead of what Bitcoin did. And then you said, suck it, uh, Peter McCormick. And so he's overtaken us. <laughs> oh, now we're number five. We're dropping like a rock, Travis. Yeah. Oh, we're, man. we're Number five slot behind Unchained, Epicenter, the Stephen LaVera podcast. Uh, oh, man, we're tied uh, for five. Now we're going down. We're, it's going down. Our reputation down. score actually dropped. Uh, 10 points, 12 points since yesterday. <laughs> I don't know why that happens, but uh, we, we'll be in the basement fun. soon. Uh, but anyway, it's just it's kind of cool to see our reputation is 734, which is pretty good for being bad. Uh, 2,319 links, 338 recent tweets, and it's got a bio here about us. So, you know, this uh, this affirms that you are in a good place by being bad. Yeah, it says the reputation score is a score between zero and a thousand assigned to products based on our algorithm. It looks at factors such as popularity on Reddit, Twitter mentions, Telegram links, crypto news, media mentions, podcast references, and other signals. I actually think that we hurt our links because we do the badcode.in forward slash blah, blah, blah. Right. That kills the amount of links that actually comes to our website. So that probably kicks us down a little bit because we should actually just give you regular links. But instead, we give you the short URL, which... That's in our we're minds, we're number two. We can never be number one because, well, we're bad, but we're, we're, we're number two. So anyway, True. thanks to Nomics for, for that shout out. And want to give one more shout out to our friends at eToro. Two more appeared overnight in our inbox, Travis, for people that signed up for eToro and they want their $50 in free Bitcoin. If you haven't done it yet, what you waiting for? We want to send it to you. If you're a U.S. citizen, go to badco.in forward slash eToro. Sign up. It's simple. They got 14 different coins that you can trade. They've got social trading. They've got copy traders, zero dollar commission trading. And we're going to give you 50 bucks in Bitcoin for following the simple, easy to follow instructions that so many citizens of the Republic of Bad Cryptopia have done before you, proving it can be done. Badco.in forward slash e. T O R O. I want my 50 bucks. Again, didn't we just do that? I don't know if we did. Money. 
money for nothing, eToro for free. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. If you get a chance, go check us out on Amazon just to go see what their platform looks like. Badco.in forward slash Amazon. We appreciate your reviews and your comments and uh, any extra Bitcoin that you want to send to us. Yeah. And thank you for all your awesomeness. Man, we're episode 446. I, I, I would bet I would bet next episode is episode 447. Are you being a futurist? I am a futurist. Well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Travis Wright, if you are correct about that, then we'll also be correct in telling our audience to say that. Who's bad? The Bad Crypto Podcast is a production of Bad Crypto LLC. The content of the show, the videos, and the website is provided for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. It's not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice of any kind. You shouldn't make any decisions as to finances, investing, trading, or anything else based on this information without undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional financial advisor. Please understand that the trading of Bitcoin's and alternative cryptocurrencies have potential risks involved. Anyone wishing to invest in any of the currencies or tokens mentioned on this podcast should first seek their own independent professional financial advisor. And I'm right about that. I did not have sexual relations with that podcast. It was mutual.